Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Having a high sports IQ is important. Just look at the NBA lottery right now. You might have a top 10 pick, but if your GM doesn't know what he's doing, you're screwed. When it comes to hiring, you don't need a high hiring IQ. All you need is ZipRecruiter. They're powerful technology scans, thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience for your job. 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. This is not how we found Kevin O'Connor. He was in the 20%. But 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. My listeners can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Meanwhile, SeatGeek, the best app for buying and selling tickets to sporting events, concerts, and more for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase on any game or sporting event for NBA, NHL, baseball, whatever. You know what to do? Use promo code BS. I would go there for baseball tickets because it is like a baseball free for all right now. You can you can basically sit in the first five rows of any ballpark for negative forty dollars. Don't quote me on that price, but it's very close. Uh, check that out. Download the SeatGeek app or go right to SeatGeek.com. Don't forget to check out the Ringer.com. That is where our excellent draft guide resides. That is where Robert Mays' awesome oral history of Gaslight Anthem went up today. And he interviewed Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen that. called Bruce. him back. Bruce. This is a good lesson for you, KOC. You the, never know. Yeah, exactly. You never Just know. Just put the, put the thing in. And all yeah. of a sudden, Bruce Springsteen's the calling you back for your oral no. history. Yeah, mm-hmm. they say, screw you. And then you move on to the next person. Uh, so check that out. We are uh, in the middle of summer movies right now. The draft. There's always something going on at the ringer. Check out uh, the, Mall- the Mallory Rubin, Jason Concepcion, Binge Mode, Harry Potter podcast. Season three. All Harry Potter started today. They, I think they're putting up five episodes this week and uh, we're just trying to prevent them from not overdosing on coffee. It's very possible. They just go back and forth from Starbucks and taste po- tape podcasts. So check that out and uh, check out the Dave Chang show, which is going up this week and, and it's an important one. So I would subscribe to that one now. And I would also subscribe to Against All Odds because Cousin Sal had his appendix out two days ago and still recorded against all odds because he wanted to get U.S. Open bets in. And I don't know where it compares to MJ's flu game. I guess maybe the stakes were a little higher with the flu game. We could have just called the podcast Better off. than LeBron's hand, right? Better than LeBron's hand because we know for a fact that his appendix got taken out. We'll never know what happened with <laughs> LeBron's hand. Coming up, Kevin O'Connor. We're going to talk about the draft. and uh, Oh, I forgot to plug one more thing. The HBO show, Courtside at the NBA Finals, that uh, we executive produced here. And I spent all my, uh, about 12 days at the finals. It is going to be Tuesday, June 19th. Put that on your calendars. It's cool. It's different. So I will tell you more next week when we get closer. Coming up, we're going to talk to Kevin O'Connor and then Nick Kroll. First, Pearl Jam. All right, KOC is here. You can hear him on a bunch of our Ringer NBA podcasts. He is the biggest contributor we have to the NBA Draft Guide. That is fantastic. It has been updated now. The mock draft point four we're up to now? I think fourth one right now. Should be doing another one pretty soon. I told Julia, just keep doing points. Point five points. That like, oh, Jackson's climbing. That time for another mock yeah. draft. Let's keep going. I'm, I'm ready for like 20 yeah. versions. We'll do another one. Maybe we'll all do right. one a day leading up to the draft. So number one, we're, so first of all, on Monday, we're going to do a lottery mock draft on this podcast, and we're going to have ringer staffers that are somehow connected to every team pick every wow. slot. Love it. I forget where we had you. I think we might have given you the one spot. Okay. Um, so I'm the Phoenix Suns. But it's, <laughs> it's a guess for, it's not who I would take care. It's who I think they're going to take. Okay. Which is an important distinction because sometimes when we do these, and we've done a few of them over the years- you know, you're like, I think Luka Doncic should go first, and that, and then you're doing this whole mock draft. That's not actually going to happen. Aiton's going to go first. That doesn't seem like that's changed. I kept waiting for like somebody else to make a run. Yeah, uh, I don't wa- see it happening. I'm wondering where where the uh, the 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 fake is. Where's the fake out that it's going to be somebody else? It hasn't happened yet for Phoenix. All indications are that it's going to be DeAndre Aiton, and it's always been DeAndre Aiton. And you're okay with this. 
Yeah, it's fine. I think Aiton's a wonderful prospect, potentially a two-way, dominant two-way player. I mean, there's a lot of knocks on his defense, um, but there's no denying that he's an elite athlete. He's shown mobility. He's somebody who long-term could become a great defensive player, but it's the offense. That's what's going to make him the number one pick with his three-point shooting ability, off the dribble, lob dunk ability. He's he's definitely a, f- a ferocious offensive p- player, potentially. On the draft guide, we have shades of Patrick Ewing, Carl Anthony Towns, and DeMarcus Cousins. So I'm guessing the athleticism of a younger Ewing, the three-point ability of Towns, and then just kind of the potential to overpower when he gets bigger of Cousins. For sure. And then also with Boogie, there's the defensive weakness. It, yes. If, if he doesn't pan out on that end of the floor where Boogie has always been a bit of a liability on the defensive end of the floor. A he, bit of a liability is kind. Of, <laughs> he just doesn't try in positions. He, he, he doesn't try, exactly. And if and if Aiton does become that guy long term, well, I mean, he's going to hurt you. But even even with an elite offensive skill set, I think Aiton should be the number one guy based on a Phoenix's roster. I mean, we saw this last year with Boston between Fultz and Tatum. You have to factor in need a little bit, even though you're still picking the best quote unquote best player available. It's still a factor. I like that he produced in college. I do. I do care about that. I think whatever basketball game at whatever level, especially if I'm taking somebody number one, I like to know that if it's a center, they're putting up 20 and 11 every night, no matter who the competition is. It, and it's a good sign. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not just scoring and rebounding, too. Like, he's a pretty good passer for his position. Yeah. He's not like a Nikola Jokic type. He's not an elite passer, but he can make really strong kickout passes off the roll. He can he can do a lot of things out there on the floor. What is the trade value of this pick, just out of curiosity? I, I've been messing around with trying to figure out what, if, the, what the trade value right now is of... Uh, Basically, if I did a trade value list this summer, I think it would how be, many people would we have to list before we get to, oh, they would trade that person for the number one pick? I'll, think, g- I'll give you some names. Okay. Giannis, Davis, Durant, Curry, Harden. None of those guys no, are in play. No. LeBron is not in play. Tatum, Simmons, Mitchell, I don't think they're in play. No. I don't right? think so, no. So there's nine. Mm-hmm. Embiid. Nope. Jokic? Mm, I'd think about it if I'm Denver because of his weaknesses on defense. Who hangs up first, Phoenix or Denver? Probably Phoenix, I would think. I think Phoenix yeah, does too. I would okay. think so. Interesting though. That's a good one. Uh, I, would do, I would do it if I were Denver for what it's worth. But I'm, I'm not as high on Jokic as a lot of people are. And well, I, he might be worse defensively. Exactly. I think the other thing, the contract stuff's the big thing to me. You mm-hmm. get eight now. And if he's giving you anything, like think about yep. Tatum right now. This is my case for why Tatum is one of the five most untradeable assets in the league. You have four more years of him at a rookie contract. Exactly. And, and the money is, needs to be factored in, whereas Jokic is about to get paid. He's about to get paid big. Range. So would you rather yeah. pay him 22 or eight and six? Like that's no contest. And, and Jokic helps you more now, to be fair. Yeah. Right? I mean, like he's a really, really good player. He's an unbelievable player. He helps passer. you finish in the late lottery. Yeah. That, that's kind of the issue. Yeah. Uh, Ola Depot and Booker. No to Booker. Ola Depot, no. No, so we're moving way down the list. I think if you're Indiana, you're not going to trade Victor Oladipo at this point. So you think Phoenix calls Indiana and says, I'll give you the number one for Oladipo. I think Indiana hangs up. I think so, too. I think they have a yeah. meeting. Are we devaluing the number one pick right now? I'm just trying to figure out what it's <laughs> worth. But the next group, Kyrie, Westbrook, Kawhi, Lillard, Clay, and Beal. Beal, I think you got to think about it. For twenty five million a year, I'd rather have eight. Well, uh, yeah. On the other side, like if you're Washington, for sure, you're, oh, you're I'm doing saying, that. I think if you're I think Phoenix, still no. Like, Westbrook, no, just because no. OKC can't no. trade him because he's the only person who um, got roped into signing long term there. They have him <laughs> trapped now, Stockholm <laughs> syndrome. And I think Lillard, you'd need more than the number one. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the other guys, though, and then when it goes down, it's you know talking about Porzingis, Jalen Brown, Brandon Ingram. Um, yeah, so it's you could argue that this is uh, an above average draft. Yeah, it's very because good. Because this number one prize of this draft would not get swapped for everybody except for about 15 guys. Yeah, uh, I think this year's draft, you have Luka Doncic and DeAndre Ayton kind of on their own, in my opinion. But the, the top, Doncic top is cooling. Which is very odd. You know why it's odd? Not odd? Because five of the six people drafting in this top six are teams you would want to trade with because they have not done a lot of intelligent stuff over the last few years. Fair, fair. However, you know, let's go through them. Sacramento at two. Very fair. 
Atlanta at three. I'm not even sure who's running well, them. Well, Travis Schlenk got hired last year, so unproven. Yeah, but who's Travis player. Schlenk? I don't even know who that or, is. Works for the Golden State Warriors. Is that a human being? <laughs> yeah. Works for the Golden State Warriors. Do you play Warriors. basketball? Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, he's, he's been the Warriors. Have you met Warriors Travis years. Schlenk? I have, I have met Travis once, yes. Wait a second. What's the Schlenk family like? I don't know. I couldn't tell you, Bill. <laughs> Travis Schlenk. Okay. Chris it's a, it's Wallace in Memphis, who has... It's hard to even narrow it down to like the top four Chris Wallace boners of the 21st century, <laughs> but he's had a lot of boners. He he is, uh, it's like Viagra cross with the Chris, gym. Chris Vernon will tell you about Hashim to beat. Incre- that was a car crash that was happening in the moment. It's not like a year later you go, oh man, ah, in retrospect. It, no, it was like, why are you doing this? And I know- Don't take Hashim to beat here. We'll probably talk about Bamba later, but- but that's one of my problems with the Bamba to beat thing. It's yeah, like he's to, more athletic. to beat like you knew when it, when the draft was happening. Like not an elite athlete, not not really the hardest worker. There was all these question marks about. We'll say though, draft. Drummond had the, most of the same question marks. Fair, and he dropped mm-hmm. to nine. And even at nine, it felt like oh man, that's kind of a wasted pick. And the camera kept showing him, and he had this sad look on his face. <laughs> but I think that was an important night for him. I think it, I think it actually kind of. Lit a fire under his I, ass. I always think of Aaron Rodgers when I think about players dropping in the draft. Yeah. Just a sad look of him in the green room until 23rd pick or whatever it was when the Packers took him. Well, that's the thing with with the draft. And I did a piece for Grantland, I think, in 2014, where I went back and redrafted everybody and tried to figure out, was there any rhyme or reason? And the reality is there isn't. It's You look at the 2013 draft, Giannis, I think, went 15. 15, yep. Gobert was 27. McCollum was 10. Jokic was on the 30s. Three best guys. And Jokic was 41. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, 21, he was the yeah. year, year after, though. Okay, yeah, fair. Yeah, he was. But just year after year, I would actually say the last two years have been the closest to mm-hmm. chalk that we've had. You know, if it's if Mitchell is in the fault spot last year, that top three is basically what the top three would be now, right? With, with Tatum and uh, Lonzo, I still yeah. think would be one of the top yeah. three picks. Lonzo will be good. And then the year before, Jalen Brown and, and uh, Ben Simmons and Ingram. Yep, that wouldn't change. I don't think that would change. No. So maybe we're getting better at this. Wait, may, may, we're well, not, because well, Luka Doncic is going to fall out of the two. I don't think we are getting better at it. No, I, I think I think th- these past couple of drafts have just been really, really, really good up top. Yeah. I think it gets hard again next year. And, and maybe in the following years, it's tough to project so far ahead. But I think the last couple of years, we've just had really good drafts. 13 is the last really weak one we've had. This is my kind of draft. You can see the car crashes and the mistakes coming. 2013 was like this, too. And I was lucky enough to do that draft for ESPN. But we had, they were just red flag guys everywhere. It was like Nerlens Noel, Anthony Bennett. Alex Len, you just everywhere you looked, you're like, ah, Cody Zeller. Ah, ooh, ah, ah. it was a lot of that. Everybody had big question marks in that draft. Yeah, everybody. And this one feels the same way. Like, would it would it shock you if Michael Porter played 180 career games? Would it shock yeah. you? Yeah, it would. Honestly, it would shock you. It, well, because of the injury. Yeah, you're saying he's got a bad back. I, it, it seems like he should be able to get through it. It seems, seems like, like it. It seems like so, it. But that's my point. It wouldn't shock you. Would it shock you if Marvin Bagley was just never in the second round of the playoffs in his entire career? That wouldn't shock me, no. Would it shock you if Trey Young was playing in China seven years from now? <laughs> um, no, I don't think it would. I'm writing about this for tomorrow, actually. About These Trae are all Young. Guy yeah. top 10 yeah. picks. <laughs> I don't think Trey Young will be playing in China in seven years for what it's worth. However, no, I, don't I, I, I do think there's a chance he goes through some of the difficulties like a Trey Burke did right. coming in as like projected as a high volume scorer. You're not strong enough, but yeah, not, not big enough, not strong enough, very lean, very small, going to be really attacked on the defensive end of the floor. He's not good at all on that end. His offense needs to be great. Like he needs to be a great offensive player, which he could be, but if he's not, that puts puts him closer to Trey Burke than Stephen Curry. Usually the draft has more of the Jaron Jackson types of just like, I know what that guy is. He'll High be floor. good. Just like, yeah, he's going to make it. It's just a question of how good he's going to be. But Al Horford was like that coming, to, coming out of oh, college. Yeah. like, that guy's going to be good. I don't know how good he's going to be, but he's going to be good. This draft has a lot of these high ceiling, low basement guys where I could see depending on the team, you think about how many crazy teams are in the top six. All of them could just get infatuated with somebody like Sacramento's the second pick. I could totally see them taking Mo Bamba. I could totally see it. Michael and then Porter explaining too. like they do like Michael Porter. Yeah. 
I, I don't know what they're capable of, but it doesn't seem like they're going to take Doncic, which you and I both think is a mistake. Yeah, I mean, that's Although the weird. You're, you're more high on Bamba now. Yeah, I mean, I have Doncic ahead of Bamba. Um, Doncic is still my number one. But you wouldn't be outraged if Bamba went to. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, I think Mo Bamba, I mean, we've talked about this before. We haven't we've talked, talked about it on a podcast. We haven't we've talked about it on a podcast. It. Let's, say, let's save Mo Bamba. Okay, let's save it. Okay. Sacramento is, is the perfect team to pick number two. It's this pick that is a perennial black cat pick. It's always bad luck. It's had some of the biggest busts we've ever had in the history of the league. Some of the biggest mistakes <laughs> that have ever been made in the 70 plus year of the National Basketball Association. Now you have a pick here, number two. All the signs are there for this train crash that I've witnessed before with the draft. <laughs> and there's three different signs saying it's going to happen again. They're going to pass Luka Doncic. They're going to take somebody. He's going to be a bust. Sacramento. Oh my God, here we go. And I can't stop it. I feel like... It's like that sliding doors movie where you can't go through the door. It it is intriguing though that it seems like Luca is the guy falling when the entire year he's basically been consi- widely considered one of the most accomplished teenage players ever to enter the draft, which is fact based on everything he's accomplished. He's an elite passer. Basketball IQ is off the charts. His shooting is developing off the dribble. Looks like Harden-esque at times. He has a finishing move. He has that step back three already. He's 18. He's got a step back three. If he's a a six foot eight version of a Goran Dragic has his floor. That's a really good player for a really long time. A Hito Turkoglu type for his floor. I really think that's what he could be easily. I, th- I love that. what level he reaches. I love that he's in that Harden Ginobili kind of DNA class. Harden and Ginobili to me is one of my favorite um, kind of comparisons that don't make sense, but then it actually makes a shitload of sense. Oh, they don't look alike. Two, they're two guys that couldn't be any different at all or any more different. But from the get-go, when Harden was coming off the bench for OKC and became their sixth man, it was like, this is Manu 2.0. And I no, never thought he'd be an and MVP. The, and those are the comps we have in the draft yeah. guy. James Harden, Jumbo, Manu Ginobili, and then Tyreek Evans is like a lower end comp. Like if a shooting never develops. That's your worst case scenario yeah, is Tyreek uh, Evans. An Evans type. I don't think he'll I just be, think he's, I, I wouldn't have agreed with that one because I think he's too good of a passer. I agree. Those Way skip passes he makes across the court at age 18. I don't think we factor age enough with the draft. Like I, I feel the same way about Kevin Knox, who I've been doing research on. Publicly, he's we not don't. 19 yet. Kevin yeah. Knox. Publicly, we don't, but privately, like in the league, they, the league they a- age, they know. I'm saying the fans. Yes. Yeah. What was Tatum when he got drafted? He was Tatum was 19 until March. Yeah. So he was. So he was just turned 18. No, oh, flipping or not, he's just yeah. turned 19 when he got drafted. Sorry. Yeah. That should matter. Yeah. It does matter. And that's why Kevin Knox, as you mentioned, is somebody like every year, you know, when it comes to scouting the draft around like late May or early June, I try to like just reset and just go back and look at everybody. Like, what did I miss? What what did I overvalue or undervalue? And Kevin Knox, it's like, wait a minute, he's six foot nine, yeah. not even 19 years old yet. Fluid off the dribble. He can shoot from NBA range from three. He shows flashes defensively. He's really, really athletic. So it's like, why do I have this guy ranked 15th? So I'm bumping it up. I think to every nine. team feels that way. Yeah, and that's what could happen. I've heard there's some buzz for him in the middle of the lottery. Her Knicks like him. They worked him out recently um, against Miles Bridges. He's the type of guy every team wants when the when exactly. when you're in the middle of the season and there's just not enough six foot seven to six foot nine guys who can shoot and be athletic. I mean, he that's could why be, people are so envious of the Celtics for sure. And he could be like a better Tobias Harris type. Oh yeah. I mean, I think Tobias Harris is a realistic outcome for him, but there there's. There's more to his game considering the fact he's only 18 years old, as you said. Did he they go to him like in him. Kentucky in a go-to way? Or that's, was that, he just like an auxiliary guy? Part, part of it was the system where it was really you know equal opportunity for yeah. everybody across the board. Part of it was him being passive at times, it felt like. Um, but then there's moments where he, I think, scored maybe 30-ish points against West Virginia earlier in the season. And that's a game to go back and watch. And it's like, okay, him five years from now in a go-to scoring role where he's fed the ball this is what you can it's get. It's a good defensive team too. Yes. To put up 30 yep. on. Mm-hmm. I think he's intriguing. And you could just make the case when in doubt, take a six foot eight guy who can play in the perimeter and shoot threes and play defense. And he's a better, about a year younger than Michael Porter. I think a better ball handler at this stage than Michael Porter. Granted, we didn't we haven't seen Porter. Um, I haven't seen him in a workout, so maybe his handle is improved, but at the college level, Knox is better handling than Porter was last we saw in high school, which obviously in order to be a great go-to scorer in the league, you got to be able to handle the ball. You got to be able to create. And for Porter, that to me is the big question mark more so than his health. Even I like some of the Porter quotes. 
He certainly has high confidence in himself. You like the confidence. I do. And now it could go the wrong way in, a, in like the Michael De- Beasley way. Or D'Angelo Russell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. D'Angelo Russell is a bad teammate. Like that's a whole different, it doesn't seem like Porter, there's no well, evidence that he's a bad teammate, I mean, here's right? Here's the thing with Russell, like, I, in high school, I've heard that like he was super humble. Like he appreciated his rise up the rankings because he was a late the Laker, bloomer. The LA thing ruined him. Yeah, and then it's like he fell into a certain situation where that cockiness that developed manifested into him being a bad teammate, as you mentioned. And maybe he changes his matures in Brooklyn. Didn't happen um, last year. Yeah, he when he came back from injury, that team fell apart completely. Mm-hmm. The Knox thing is um, a nice little monkey wrench for this because I really liked. Uh, Mikael Bridges on uh on Villanova, but he's twenty two. He's three years older mm-hmm. than Knox. So I would look at somebody like Knox and and ask myself, in three years, is this guy gonna be as good as Bridges right now? The answer has to be yes, yeah. right? Yep. So why wouldn't he go ahead of him? I think that's how it's gonna play out. I think so too. I, I think Mikael Bridges is very interesting. I, Bridges I, I gonna mean, follow the Clippers. You think 12 or 13? I think he falls to 12 or 13 because two teams will make a mistake and and pull guys into the top 12 we didn't even realize. And all of a sudden, they're going to get one of them. I think the Clippers are in a good spot. I think Philadelphia could take him at 10. Maybe. Um, We'll see about that. But I'm not sure any higher than that in the draft. I think 10 could potentially be his ceiling. And And Trey Young is the big swing guy, right? He could go six. He could go 14. We we just have no idea. Yeah, I I mean, that's the thing is like, if he doesn't go to six to Orlando, I wonder... Depending on how the board shakes out, I know at nine, Knicks like him. Um, after that, I don't know. I love the fact Sacramento, really the only thing they don't need is a point guard. You could make the case, if I were them, I would take Luke at two and I would trade Darren Fox and I would offer Darren Fox to Memphis at four. And um, They'd say no. Though. Orlando at six. I think both of them would say no. For Fox? Yeah, I do. Fox, you, Fox can't hasn't proven that he can shoot it at a high level yet. I really like Fox. I do too. Would you take but, him if you're the Knicks at nine? Depends on who else is on the board. If 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 you're trading Michael Porter for for Colin Sexton, I'm sorry for De'Aaron Fox. No, if you're trading Miles Bridges, think I'll think about it. How about Cavs at eight? I prefer Wendell Carter, who I think will be there for them. I like him. He's going to yeah. be solid. I'm a big I'm a big Carter fan. Yeah. I don't know how to Bagley, which seems nuts, but well, you know what I I don't I I actually might agree with that because it did seem like he was kind of discounted at Duke and at least the games I saw. I never understood why they weren't feeding him more. Yeah, so like Marvin Bagley clearly was the better college player, better scorer, more athletic, put up stats. Yeah, I mean, he puts up big numbers. He helped that team on the offensive end of the floor, but that doesn't always mean you're going to be better in the NBA. It doesn't mean you're always going to make a a better impact towards winning. Carter to me is a great passer for his position. He can shoot threes. He can, he's a better athlete than he gets credit for. Like he occasionally will throw down lob dunks. Yeah. And defensively he gets knocked for being a plotting big. And I just, I don't see it. I, I think, I think he's a good athlete, not a great one, but he's very smart, hardworking player who has a lot of skills that, tend to translate to the NBA. So for me, it's like he looks like an Al Horford type of player. Doesn't mean he'll reach that level defensively. Horford is, is elite on the defensive end of the floor. Yeah. But Carter at least is in that mold to become a just an all around impact player who can maybe be even a little bit better offensively down the line. And Horford was a great athlete in college and it was just a zero percent chance he was going to be a good pro. I remember being, like the Celtics lost to Rand and Oden that lottery, but I was also really disappointed they didn't get Horford. It seemed like it was impossible for them not to be in the top three. And then to not get any of those guys. If they'd gotten Horford, they don't trade for Ray Allen. And I'm not yeah. I'm not sure how that whole uh KG thing goes. Who know I mean that that's the fascinating thing to me with the draft, which always makes it so exciting. It's like right now we're doing all these mock drafts, we're trying to figure out where these guys are gonna go. But there's gonna be trading opportunities that come over the next week that's gonna just completely wipe out all the mock draft preparation and everything, and it's gonna be insert this variables into teams destinies. Like if you're trading up for a guy, that means you need to feel supremely confident that he is going to be the guy that changes your franchise. Well, we so, the mistakes so, we've seen, we've seen uh work out for teams too. With Mitchell, we saw it work out last year. Right. With Fultz doesn't look good. Well, we have some cuckoo for Cocoa Puff teams in there. Sacramento too. Who the hell even knows what they need or value or want. Atlanta at three, they just don't even have a roster. They have like Dennis Schroeder. <laughs> they need everything. Collins. <laughs> 
Do they ha- even have another guy that you would care about? There's, um, I mean, DeAndre. Oh, I like DeAndre uh, Bembry, Tayshawn Prince. I like, uh, I, I, sorry, uh, let me. I misspoke. Uh, Toreen Prince. I like Toreen yeah. Prince. Yeah, he's good. So three and a half guys. Yeah. They have some guys, but yeah. not, but not the guy. Do they That's have a guy mean. that anyone is going to pay more than twenty dollars for a ticket for? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's why, like, that team could get sucked into Bagley. Be like, hey, Bagley, come see Marvin Bagley. He's going to score 20 points and get 11 rebounds a game, and we're going to go 28 and 54. I mean, the, that's the intriguing thing. Buy the I, Marvin Bagley jersey. I've heard Marvin Bagley and Michael Porter for Sacramento. I've heard Marvin Bagley and Jaron Jackson for Atlanta. And then for Memphis, it Bagley's also seems to be on their list, too. And, and, and I do wonder, maybe for those teams, it is partially that, where Bagley offers that immediate return, where he's going to come in and he's going to be good right away. Like He could easily be a favorite for Rookie of the Year. Oh, yeah. No he'll, doubt he'll about it. He'll put up it. the numbers. No doubt. And that's an appeal for a franchise that's like, we need something now. We need something now. And that's, again, could be one of the reasons why Luka could be slipping because there's just the athleticism questions. But to me, it's like, if you want someone to help you right away, Luke is the guy yeah. with his passing ability and his shooting ability, the shooting potential. I think Luke is the one who helps immediately. If they don't take Luca, what's their GM's name? Travis Schlank. I'm going to have a problem with Travis Schlank. <laughs> What if like they Travis, take, what are you doing? What, what if they take this Jack- guy could be a superstar in Atlanta? Atlanta said Dominique was like the last player they've had that anyone's given a shit yeah, about. But so could Jaron Jackson, though. Jaron Jackson is He's a guy. He's not a superstar. You're not paying I, $120 to go see Jaron Jackson. But we just talked about age, and Jaron Jackson also is only 18 years old, still one of the youngest guys in the draft. He's really, really fantastic on the defensive end of the floor. 7'5 wingspan, 9'2 standing reach, really good athlete, a uh, high character kid. I can't, I would never knock somebody for taking Jaron Jackson. Over Doncic? No, I just, I can't. Come on. And and as much as I love Luka Doncic, there's still no denying the fact that in today's NBA, really, like, you need to be able to create out the dribble. And that's the biggest question. I'm not allowing you on the Doncic bandwagon. You're off. Even though I'm ranked number one. No, I don't care. I don't care. I love, I love, I don't care. I I don't like your commitment. I love Luka. I don't like your commitment. We're all in on this one. I just feel like I value things more than you. That's well, what it is. Every once in a while, there's an NBA draft thing that that pops up and you have to pick a side. It was this way with Steph Curry. It was this way with Durant or Odin. <clears throat> it was this way. I'm trying to think who else. Ben Simmons was a good one. Jabari versus Andrew Wiggins. Granted, that hasn't been that interesting, but it, but it was one. But that was really like, I was all in on Embiid going first that year and then he yeah. got hurt. Yeah, me too. But I think that was the correct take. This one, I, I think people have to go on the record and either go all in or not, I'm going all in. I think it's a massive mistake for him not to go first in this draft. I would agree. Over Aiden, even. I 100% I would take agree. him over every dude. This is crazy that he's not going to go number one. I can't. I thought but, it was like a smokescreen, and apparently it's not. But I feel like you and I value bigs differently. So it's like I can, I, I can understand the logic of taking a big man because I think they're very important in heading into this next era in the 2020s. And with Luca, there are question marks. I think he should be the number one pick. I would take him number one. I would not even really think about it. I it's think he's the number one guy. I think you're covering your bases. Yeah. You're Lu- covered both ways. Lu- Luca, Luca's going to be in the league for a very long no, time. Luca, if you're listening, you know who cares. <laughs> Don't invite KOC to your MVP party. I want I want the invite. Hold on, we're going to take a break. <laughs> Hey, the U.S. Postal Service is an important tool for any business reaching every household every day. Stamps.com brings all the amazing services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. Buy and print officially U.S. postage with your own computer and printer. Stamps.com even sends you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage. And they have postage discounts you can't get at the post office. It is the U.S. Postal Service right at your fingertips. Any letter, any package, any class of mail, you're in control of all of it. You know why I love Stamps.com? I like handing my outgoing mail and packages right to my mail lady. Why would I want to get my car to mail something? Be like me. Use the code BS for this special offer up to $55 free postage, a digital scale, and a four-week trial. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, type in BS, that is stamps.com, enter BS, sign up today. And while we're here, check out NBA Desktop, uh, America's most popular weekly Twitter slash YouTube show hosted by Jason Concepcion. This week is really funny. Uh, the the LeBron James J.R. Smith statues from game one of the 2018 finals were brought to Hollywood Boulevard and uh, people reacted. Please check it out. It's a great show. We're very proud of it. All right, back to KOC. All right, we're back. Uh, 
we've established that KFC doesn't get invited to Luka Doncic's <laughs> uh, draft uh, MVP party. The first one. You can get invited to the third one. Okay. Yeah, his yeah. third MVP. Three time MVP, Luka Doncic. So we do value players <laughs> differently because I think the most important thing to have is a guy who can create in the last five minutes of a game. I'm with you. He can do that. I'm not sure Jaron Jackson can. I think Jaron Jackson sounds like he would be an absolutely the guy who could be the second best guy on a championship team if his career goes the right way. I don't think he'd be the best guy. I think Doncic can be the best guy. Now, people are split on that. I've talked to people in the league who think he'd be an overqualified second guy, but not quite athletic enough to be. That's the, Luka, the right? one. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think you could have said the same thing about Harden coming out of college too. And I think that's, I, I'm way older than you and I've, I've seen a lot of draft picks go badly. The one thing that I think is just transferable decade to decade to decade is like competitiveness yep. and just an insatiable desire to work on your game, which he has already. He's fucking competitive and he try and he tries to add shit to his game. And I think by the time he's 25, you know, Harden, who I, I think just people think he goes to strip clubs every night and doesn't do anything. <laughs> Harden has taught himself all these things over the last five years that have vaulted him to this entirely different level. Harden just doesn't sleep. That's why. Well, maybe he doesn't. Yeah. Maybe he's learning at the strip joint. But, uh, <laughs> but he's just added things. And the great players add stuff and they're super competitive and they just want to keep getting better and better. And I think he's wired that way. And that's part of it with Luca. So like you mentioned, there's the questions about his athleticism, his ability to create. That has improved for him over time. As you would expect, he's not, he just turned 19, yeah. right? And he worked it out at P3 um, in Santa Barbara, I believe last summer, which helped him improve athletically. The problem is, it's like, we're watching him. This is like game 90 for him in the last calendar year or so. That's a really schedule. important point though. The He's fatigue. played 90 games. Yeah. Jaron Jackson played 30. Exactly. 35. Exactly. So, so and he got through the whole thing. As it does for every NBA player, even LeBron James, all these high level elite athletes and, and at, at their peak, even these guys get tired in game 70, game 80, game 90. Luka Doncic is a teenager, and that's why I think we've seen a little bit of a regression from him over the last couple of months. Doesn't change the fact that he still won the title. He still is producing at a, at a very, very high level. To me, that's why he's number one. He he's probably, number and one. he's playing with dudes who are like having smoke breaks at halthtime. Passing Marlboro Reds around or, or the Camel not, Blues. I, I don't know. Camel Blues, know. Kyle. What do they smoke on Real Madrid? Camel Blues. In in the Euro League, though, like it's a men's league. You're playing against grown you're playing men. You're, these got dudes are having beer after even the game. If, in even their if locker. they are, though, they're at least fully physically developed and they're fighting to provide for their families. They're whereas... hairy beer drinking adults. <laughs> That's who he's playing against, Luca. Uh, I can't believe Atlanta would pass him. That would be the most exciting player they've drafted literally in 30 years. I'm not convinced they will. I'm still I'm still not I don't, convinced. I think you're right. I don't screen. I think they would have sent Oh, you're convinced that they might. I'm no, I'm not I'm I'm not convinced that all these teams are going to pass on him. I'm not convinced that Atlanta's going to pass on him for Bagley or Jackson. I'm not. If he went to Sacramento, I would actually be fired up because that means he's on West Coast. <laughs> I like watching these dudes on the West Coast cuz potentially we'd have LeBron and the Lakers. Fun Clipper team. We have the Warriors. We have Phoenix with just Great. all these lottery picks they have. And then we'd have Doncic in Sacramento. It's kind of loaded for it's the 730 good. to 10 o'clock Pacific pr Coast time. Pretty, pretty good, yeah. Sorry, East Coast. You guys shouldn't live there, you dumbasses. <laughs> should live here. We get basketball. It comes on earlier. Uh, how much do you put into... So uh, when I interviewed De'Aaron Fox on the Ringer NBA show a couple of weeks ago, I asked him about like, you know, what do you... This was before the draft lottery and we talked about the top draft prospects and he, he didn't seem super excited about Luka Doncic. Part of it was, I wouldn't be if I was him. Of course not. I mean, but I wonder I if, like, have the ball now. if you're Sacramento's front office, I wonder how much you put into that. If you perceive De'Aaron Fox as your point guard of the future, if the way you want to build your team is having De'Aaron as the primary creator, maybe that's why you might lean towards a forward, a big like Bagley who scores and compliments De'Aaron Fox. But I think I think that's thinking too much about fit. More so than just like just getting the best take player. Take the star. But guess what? Fox won't be in the team in four years if you take Doncic. But I, okay. I'm higher on him than you. I, I think he has a chance to be somewhat special too. Oh no, I'm right high there character him. kid. The only De weakness, you mean. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The only weakness is his outside shot. But I think he's one of those dudes who will stay in the gym until he gets it. That's a pretty big weakness, it. though. I know, but it's not like it's broken. It's not it's like not. a Michael Kidd Gilchrist, just how do you fix that thing? His elbow's going at the wrong angle. Good free throw shooter. His pretty good touch. 
uh, and a hard clutch. worker. Yeah. I like, clutch, I like, yeah. uh, yeah. he had some, even though he didn't have, he had a pretty up and down rookie season, he had some good, like, end of the game moments. He hit game winning shots, go yeah. ahead shots. I like and that. And game tying shots. I don't know. I really like the Aaron. Super confident. Like, if you see him, like, if you're in the room with him, he's, he, it's like Oladipo, mm-hmm. like, just kind of alpha doggy. Yeah. High character kid, too. I would try to Very trade. Very funny. I liked him. Yeah, I, I've I heard good things about him. I would try to trade for him if I was in the six to nine range. I I would value him more than like if the choice is if Orlando's like let's take Trey Young, I would rather have Fox. See, to me, like that's the type of situation where both see, both teams say no. Like Sacramento values Fox probably more than the other team is willing to give. Right? I, I like I feel like if you're Sacramento, you're you're like no, we're keeping our guy. We know we know what we have with him more so than the uncertainty of the sixth pick. Well, if they do like Bagley and he does drop to six for some crazy reason, sure. If they take Luca two, yeah, and then Bagley's there at six. So Jackson like, or goes Porter, three. Porter's there at six, perhaps because they do like Michael Porter. Yeah, then maybe that could make some sense. So then you have crazy Memphis at four, who have Gasol and Conley coming back. Mm-hmm. Their owner gave a just a whack job interview today about how I didn't see the, that they what have a say? chance. Their their goal is to win over fifty games next yep. year. Yeah, they want to win. Gasol and Conley are back. I think that that picks in play. It is. And I think they're a team that would consider trading down. Like if you're the Clippers and you want to trade up for Luca, who falls to four or Bamba, who they also like Jerry West really likes Mo Bamba. If you want to trade up for Michael Porter, maybe you package 12 and 13 and Tobias Harris and you offer that. They say, no, they ask for more. Give Patrick Beverly. Maybe Memphis looks at that. They're like, huh? Suddenly we have 12 and 13 Beverly, Mike Conley, Marcus soul, add this, add that, bring back Tyreek Evans. Suddenly you're looking at a definitely a 40 high mid four, high 40s win team I think. I don't think that's unrealistic. I would do that if I was Orlando. I would do 6 for 12 and 13. I wouldn't do 4. I wouldn't do 4 either. Kyle, can can you after we finish taping this dub in some serious music cuz I have a very important question for KOC right now. I need like somber <laughs> ER like the person's about to maybe lose a kidney type of music. <laughs> Memphis calls Boston. You know where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. And they say, we'll trade you four for Jalen Brown. You can have Luka Doncic. What does Boston do? I would do it. and You would do it if you're a Boston. I would do it, and I'll tell you why. I was thinking about this on the way in. If you're Boston, you're about to get Gordon Hayward back. Tatum's about to get better. You have this plethora of wings and guards who handle like Kyrie Irving and Jalen Brown suddenly gets bumped down the totem pole to really maybe the fourth or fifth, maybe even sixth on some occasions. His yeah. minutes are getting yanked yeah. around and his role suddenly becomes diminished into becoming a spot up shooter, a cutter and a defender. And that's important to have. He's in a Jay Crowder Cavs situation it's, where exactly. it just could be not happy at all. And so if you are able to flip that and replenish it, somewhere else on the roster, whether you it's Luca or maybe you draft a big, but you can replenish that with a cheaper asset, maybe in the back of the first round with that 27th pick, finding a three and D guy. And there's quite a handful of them in this year's draft. So you get a lower cost, a guy who ha- doesn't have aspirations of being the, the one of the best players in basketball, like Jalen does. And you're able to flip that asset at its peak value for the fourth pick where you can get your choice maybe of Luca, as you mentioned, or maybe it's Mo Bamba, your center of the future. I know If they do that, I'm going to fight everybody. (laughs) I'm going to start with you, and then I'm going to fight the rest of the ringer staff. What about Jaron Jackson? What if you're getting more back? What if it's more than that? I just want to say, I don't want to trade Jalen Brown, and I do think he's special. And the checkpoints that he hit in his first two years, he's ahead of where Kawhi Leonard was, and he's ahead of where Paul George was. Like, just period. Go any statistical evaluation. His first two versus those two, age, experience, playoff experience that he got, every sort of metric, he's ahead of those guys. How so com- if I'm trading Jalen Brown, I'm trading somebody who right now is on pace to be better than Kawhi and Paul George. How confident are you? In, and I, I realize I'm asking this as the person who at the time of the draft was like arguing his shot was better than people think it is. But right now I'm arguing the opposite. Do you think his shot is as good as it actually looked? 39.5% from three, but still only 64% from the free throw line. Is he as good of a shooter right now as he looked last season? Or is he actually somewhere in the middle, like a 30%, 36% No, I, I think shooter? he's a good shooter. And I think he played hurt from the beginning of the Philly series on. I think he was 
between 65 and 80%. And, and in still the Cleveland well. series, it started to catch up yeah. with them near the end there because it was every other day. And I think game seven, that was one of the reasons. Not making excuses. I just think as playoffs go on, your body starts feeling like crap. I would not trade him unless Doncic was on the board. I would have a long meeting about it. Because here's the other factor. You trade Jalen to Memphis. Gasol comes back. Conley comes back. They sign a free agent. All of a sudden, that's a 40-win team. And then the Celtics get their pick next year because it's top eight protected yeah. and becomes the 14th pick. I'm not sure I want to help them get better. On the other hand, if they take Doncic at four and he ignites them and you know within two years, that's not even a lottery pick. And then you get nothing for that pick. I don't think Chris Wallace would ever trade with the Celtics would be my guess after he because got fleeced by Jeff before. Green. Well, and plus he, everybody has by Jeff Green. Though. Well, that's true. I think if it goes to Dallas at five, though, and I don't think if Doncic gets out of the top four, that would be one of the strangest but why things. Why do you think it's Luca? For sure, though. Like they have so many ball handlers on their team already. I, I, You're I feel, really riding this Bamba thing. Yeah, I, ju- I just think bigs are important and you need to have a young big. There's nobody on the roster. Like they have so many guards, so many wings, but they don't have a young big cost controlled. That have developing that can also contribute in the short term behind Al Horford. So when Horford, I would look at it this way: they're just looking at it holistically next ten years. If they evaluate Doncic as a super duper Mm. star, that's as somebody that could be one of the best ten players in the league potentially, and they already have a guy in their roster, Tatum, who is going to be one of the best ten players in the league if he does get hurt, and you just go go from there. It's like I don't know what else we're going to have, but we would have those two guys. And short term, we could compete for a title with what we have anyway. But four years from now, sure, these are our two guys. That's how you'd have to think about it. Now, do they feel that way about Jalen Brown? I don't know. They might. And then that also raises the question about, like, let's say theoretically this happened and they added Luka Doncic. Then maybe Kyrie is somebody where it doesn't matter as much if he were to bounce and leave next summer for the Knicks. Yeah, I mean, or, or maybe he becomes an asset after resigning in two, three, four years. Because you have Luca in the pipeline ready to take on that big jumbo point guard starting role. Yeah, the Kyrie stuff, I, I'm ignoring all of it. I think he was out of the loop these last couple months. <laughs> Are you afraid to look too closely at it? I'm a little afraid. <laughs> I'm a little afraid. I don't want to stare at it for too long. I would be afraid. I mean, New York has always had plans for Kyrie whenever he gets free agency. And Kyrie is from New York. He, here's my solace with the New York thing. It is the most dysfunctional, terrible franchise mm-hmm. that we've had this century. And all of these NBA guys have Twitter and they have the internet and they have League Pass. And it just seems like a train wreck of a franchise. Durant didn't even take a meeting there. But uh, but Durant also proved anything can happen. He joined a 73-9 and nine team that beat his team in seven games in the Western Conference Finals. Literally anything can happen. But he went to a good franchise. It's a good franchise, yeah. And it's You're a- signing with James Dolan. Yeah, but if, if you're Kyrie, New York's a great city too. Maybe you don't care as much about James the owner. Dolan's your he, boss. He played for, for Dan. Would Gilbert you want to work for, for James Dolan? No, I wouldn't. But maybe if you're Kyrie, you're willing to work for anybody. It's just about where you are and what you're doing. Kyrie seems like the type of guy where all that stuff. He does, I think I believe he once said he doesn't let distractions into his life. <laughs> right. I believe that's a quote from Kyrie somewhere out there. Um, so what do you he think? Care at number eight. What do you think is the best possible guy for Cleveland to get? Um, I think the guys they're looking at are Wendell Carter. Who we I'm talked saying, about like, earlier, let's say Colin LeBron Sexton. stays. Who helps them next year the most? Um, I mean, Mikael Bridges at 22 years old. He'll be a 22 year old rookie. Is ready to come in and play right away. Uh, I so think he's somebody who? Help. So you're saying he's getting like the Rodney Hood slash yeah, the J.R. Jeff Smith Green role. minutes? Yeah, and and the thing is, is how much is a rookie going to help you though? Right. So that's why if you're Cleveland, I'm not sure there is a guy that helps you from day one. That's why I think with that pick, Kobe Altman, Cleveland's general manager, needs to still be thinking post-LeBron because you need to be thinking four or five years from now still. Like you mentioned with Boston, right? LeBron might come, could come back, but it might only be for a year or yeah. two. You need to be thinking about the three, four, five years from now. And I think Wendell Carter is the guy that I'd be really looking at, and they do like Colin Sexton too. If they know LeBron's leaving, the pick they make at eight, would be a pick you would make if you're retooling your team, right? And maybe they can get to a point where after July 1st, they sign and trade LeBron for Kuzma so they can make it so he can get a longer deal or whatever. But um, I still don't think like 
that's suddenly the bleakest situation in the league. If he leaves, they they're over a hundred million dollars in contracts. Like what what would they have been this season? Like a twenty five win team without LeBron? Yeah, I still I still feel like there's another gear for Kevin Love that I'd want to see. Maybe he's just a guy who should be putting up big well, stats what, what on bad teams. was Minnesota teams. when he was averaging twenty five? Well, that's the thing. They were like twenty five and whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what do you think is the best candidate to? drop out of the top 10 and just they keep showing him in the stands and it's sad. I don't think it's any of the top seven guys. I think, you know, from Aiton, Dontridge, Jackson, Bagley, Bamba, Carter, Porter, I think all those guys are going to go in the top 10. Um, it's it's Trey Young. He's the interesting guy where to me it's like, well, maybe he goes six. Maybe if he doesn't go to the Knicks at nine, he falls to 10, 11, 12 range. Um well, for and, a reason and, that we've talked about for last year in this podcast, the point guard glut. Everybody has a point Everybody's guard. Everybody's got a point guard. And, There's like three teams that don't. And with Trey Young, like he is so undersized. Yeah. Uh, so lean, so small. I'm not sure there's a lot of room for his frame to get stronger. Uh, and we saw in the playoffs, every def- small defensive point guard is getting picked on. Everyone from Damian Lillard, CJ McCollum, even Terry Rozier, who's a good defender, was getting attacked relentlessly by the Cavaliers. Steph Curry, yeah. everybody's trying to attack Steph. It's obvious teams attack the weak link on a defense, but it just so happens the small guy is often the team people are trying to, to get switches on so they can post up and, and either draw double teams. The rent to the out. litter. And that's where Trey Young, it's like, well, if he becomes an elite offensive player, it doesn't matter. Who cares if he stinks defensively? But if he doesn't, I don't know. I, I have questions about where I'd feel comfortable drafting him. I'm not letting you do your PR work for Bamba on this podcast. You're not allowed. I'm not letting you do it. I'm not letting you do it. I'm not letting you get roped in by Can those we talk YouTube talk about the importance of big men, though, in the league? I'm not letting you get roped in by those YouTube videos. I will say I was ready to fight you to the death on this. And then they posted that one clip when he was just draining threes from the quarter. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> See, I did like a 180. I'll, I was like, oh my God. I'll tell you, Bill. I saw him work out and, you know. And he was doing that. He wasn't doing that. He The day I saw him, it was around like 50% you know, shooting the ball, which wasn't, it's not great. It was so easy. The thing is, is like, I think if you're a team evaluating Bamba right now, you're looking at, right now, we're recording this on June 13th started changing his mechanics about two months ago and the progress over those two months is pretty significant. Yeah. I, I think in terms of his mechanics, his, I agree. His release looks terrific. Uh, there's some things in his lower body, the way, the way he jumps forward that need to be fixed a little bit, but he, his progress as a shooter is really remarkable as is his footwork. To me, that's what makes him so tantalizing. Cause it's like, I think he has the baseline to be a long-term successful player without the jumper. With his size, rim running, screening, defensive ability, rebounding. I get it. It's All more it's there. more athletic Rudy Gobert who can shoot threes. Sure. That's a good basketball player. The, the thing is, is again, like Rudy Gobert, what makes him Rudy Gobert is mentality, his mindset. I mean, he's a killer out there on the floor. Does Bamba have that? Maybe. Maybe not. He's certainly articulate. Very. He certainly could talk about having it, but I'm not sure if he has it. Yeah. Um, it's not like we weren't watching him just destroy people in Texas. He did have some good box scores, though. I, and, I looked know, it up. And that, that'll that be the question with Bamba, right? So, like, over the course of a full season in the playoffs, like, when it's when it's minute 35 for him on the court, is he giving it at that elite level? I don't know. I picture sure. you at those Darko workouts in 2003, just like, I saw Darko today. He was incredible. <laughs> He's a great athlete. <laughs> He's he's a hybrid five. He's got everything you'd need. I hope that's not Mo Bamba. I don't think I just, it is. I, I'm old enough now to see the red flags, and there's red flags with this. Where what like are the, the workout flags? the workout warriors scare me? Forget the workouts though. Just look at the games. He did put up. He rebounded in the games, which I think is important. He had a lot of double figure rebound games. It wasn't like he was MIA. What else are red flags for Mo Bamba though? I, I get. I, I the I get, red flag for me is. It doesn't seem like side to side he can I just keep picturing him getting switched on smaller dudes and just being unable to stay in front of I them. I can picture that with literally any big man though. I mean like they're I know, very, Jackson I think might be able to guard guards from what I've seen. Like eventually. But at an elite level. 
I'm not sure. I, I think with Bamba, like he covers. Could he so do what much Al Horford ground. does defensively? Jackson six years from now. Yeah, I, I think he could. I, I think so for sure. And I Which think, is about as as good as you're going to hope for. And I think that'll be the question teams ask. So with Mo Bamba, he is both Jackson and Bamba are great shot blockers. The question is, is like with today's league, so many teams switching. You're going to be bringing these guys out on the perimeter anyway, where they're shot blocking around the rim may not have as much value, but. That's not the case again. Every matchup in every team, there are teams that have a big man that's in playing inside, or they have a big man that you're not going to be switching. Where you're going to play traditional pick and roll defense, drop in the big or or hedging, where that shot blocking still has value. So to me, it's like, yes, big men don't have the same level of importance as they did in the '90s and maybe the early 2000s. But in the playoffs, we saw they still have an immense important role in the game. It's just Golden State's not going to last forever. You're not going to have to go against Draymond Green at the well, five Especially not the if they keep having moments like that parade yesterday. What the fuck was that? That was the weirdest thing. What are thing. you doing, Warriors? What, 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 Why make that awkward? What were they thinking? I didn't understand that ba- at all. Ba- Bob Myers' face after he said that was almost like, what was I what? thinking? Like, what, what would I say that for? Maybe he had a couple of drinks in him. I don't know. What's had, the had funniest team for Bamba to go to? That would be that would be the scariest for his future success. I say Sacramento I mean, too. It's always Sacramento by default. That's though, such isn't a red it? flag. It's, he's in that number two bad luck spot. He's in Sacramento bad luck. It's he, there's, they take him too high. It just says all the makings. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I hate. Vlad is like I was impressed by his three pointers. <laughs> I, I, I hate made him pile- sound Russian for some reason. Kind of. <laughs> I hate piling on Sacramento, but it's the truth. It is until until they get back in their winning ways, like in the early 2000s when it was terrific back then, back when Vlade was a player and not a general manager. Until they get back to that, they they are the answer by default. What if uh, what if he goes to Dallas and he's in a twin tower situation with Pants DJ? <laughs> <laughs> I think, in, inside joke for people who follow dumb NBA stuff. I think Rick Carlisle would like him though. Yeah, I think he would. Uh, I think Bamba going to Orlando would be really funny too for just for the Kevin Clark reactions. Oh yeah, who's probably excited just to watch a fun Magic player, and then it's like, here's the center project, Mo Bamba. He's he, seven foot four and weighs forty pounds. It's funny you brought up Orlando. That that's where I wonder where the question really is with big man. And I think big men unquestionably are still important. Yeah. To me, the question is like how much cost are you willing to give towards certain types of big men? And we're about to find that out this coming summer with Clint Capella, depending on the offer sheet that he gets, Daryl Morey is going to have to make a decision. Am I willing to pay a rim running center, a rim protecting center, $25 million when I already have. Can I tell all- you the answer? Is it no? The answer is yes. It's Yes. I think if LeBron is out for them, they just run it back. They won 65 games and came very close to making the finals. And if they made the finals, they would have won the title. And you could argue if Chris Paul doesn't get hurt, they win. I would run that back. Like, I'm not going nuts this summer. It's like, can we get LeBron? No? Okay, let's run it back. Clint, how much you want? And yeah. they'll do some smart salary with him. First of all, he's not getting $25 million a year because where's he getting that from? If Phoenix drafts a center. What do, you, what do you think he ends up getting? Not 25. I would say like 17, 18. Range. All it takes is one, though. But who's the one? What if it's is like it in, Dallas? In Indiana? They have a ton of cap space. Maybe. Indiana is interesting. Yeah. Maybe, maybe maybe if you're in Indiana, you think about flipping Miles Turner, bringing in Capella, have Capella and Sabonis, flip Turner. How about this? Somewhere. Let me throw this one at you. Free agency Capella, Miles Turner for Kevin Love. Mm. How about how about Miles Turner for CJ McCollum? Like Miles I Turner. I don't think Turner, he's Turner I think CJ McCollum's higher than value West. Turner Some, for love. Turn, Turner plus blank. Whatever makes it work. And I'm not sure I love the McCollum or Old Depot backcourt, but. I don't like it either. I I, uh, I like the idea of love in Indiana. I think he would find himself. I, I think, think those crazy Indiana people would love him. Old Depot McCollum would be interesting though too though. It's high high, high scoring backcourt. Old Depot the thing is he's defense. a much better defensive player than Lillard is. So it could work. How many people in this draft have the potential to be the best player in the draft? Ayton. Doncic, Bamba, potential. I'm not I, saying they'll get there. I think seven. Seven? Seven guys. Um, actually, no, not seven. Jackson? Right now, I have Luca and Aiton in their own tier. And then after that- I'm not, That's not the question. Okay. Though. How many of them conceivably could be the best part in the draft? Four. Bamba, Jackson? Yeah, Bamba, Jackson, Aiton, Doncic. After that- it's inconceivable. I, mean, <laughs> I think it's. I agree with you. I think it's I, inconceivable. There, there's a slim chance it's a Bagley or a Porter. Um, no, it's not happening. But I don't. I 
wouldn't bet on it. So Friday, you're doing Ringer NBA show draft party. Draft then class. Draft class. Draft party. We always have parties. Yeah. Uh, draft <laughs> class on Friday. Yeah. Last one before the draft. It's been great all spring. Then Monday, you're going to come on here to do uh, be part of the giant Ringer mock Sweet. draft we're going to do. And then all next week, we're going to have Jonathan Charks. He's coming. We're doing videos. We're going to do live stuff on the draft. whole bunch of stuff. Pumped. Looking forward to it. Keep it going, KOC. You're doing great. Thanks, Bill. This is right. fun. We'll be back after this. All right, before we get to Nick Kroll, let's talk about propercloth.com. Every guy knows that it's hard to find a dress shirt that fits. Collar too tight, sleeves too long, shirts too loose. Come on. I have some good news. Ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to Proper Cloth. Create a custom shirt size in seconds by just answering 10 easy questions, no measuring re required. Choose from over 20 collar styles, 10 cuff styles, and 500 fabric styles from classic to business to completely customize your shirt and get the style you want, all high quality with the absolute best quality and craftsmanship starting at just $80. Proper Cloth guarantees a perfect fit, meaning that if somehow your shirt doesn't fit perfectly, they will remake it for free. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Look your best. Go to propercloth.com slash BS. Enter gift code BS to save $20 on your first shirt. Again, propercloth.com slash BS. Gift code BS. And since we're here, theringer.com today. Check it out. Robert May's big oral history on Gaslight Anthem's The 59 Sound. Yeah. Bruce Springsteen's in it. Check it out. It's on theringer.com right now. All right, let's bring in Nick Kroll. All right, Nick Kroll is here. You've never been here. I have not. We ran into each other at David Chang's house. Yes. He was cooking for us. Indeed. And we were all shooting the shit in his backyard. And I was like, I got to get this guy in a podcast. Yeah. I've, I've been, done no preparation for it. And I'm not prepared at all, but I'm not really worried. I, I, I really like the backyard. Yeah, I think we'll be all right. I mean, we don't have Chang to um, uh, self-obsessively talk about what's going on, if, if everyone's after him or not. And, the, and, and do we like the food? What's wrong with it? Yeah. Why didn't you have the rest of that? But I I mean, you know what was interesting came up there? It was an interesting thing of like um, p competitiveness. Yeah. Because like, Chang is like, I need, we were talking about Jordan and that and ki like killers. You know yeah. what I mean? And Chang it was like, I think Chang is fueled by that. And I found that very interesting to be like, oh, right. That's how he's like. You know, and I mean, like he needs it. I think he was like a college or he's like a high school golfer or something like he was. that. It's part of his, I think, what motivates him. He was he has this whole thing about chefs and athletes and some of the similarities. It's yeah. pretty interesting and how they're friends, but they're not. And they have frenemies and then just flat out people you hate. Right. And, yes. Uh, it's it's a little bit similar. I was listening to um, your interview with Oakley. Yes, who, who, the highlight of my career. You mean? I, I know. It, I'm still getting feedback a week later for it. Oh, it was. It's, it's a dream podcast. I mean, you know it when it's happening. You're like, all right, I'll never top this. Well, because he was sort of openly saying his opinions about people and things, and it's kind perfect. of it, it was. He's fascinating because he. I grew up in. I grew up as a Nick fan at that time. Like that was my team. I grew up, you know, early '90s, came of age like falling with, in love with that Nick team, and uh, I went to school in White Plains. Yeah, and um, and Charles Oakley lived right in the neighborhood, and me and my friend Andrew walked into the Rosedale Deli one day, and Oak was in there drinking like a one liter uh, <laughs> uh, Hawaiian punch, <laughs> and he was just like, "They don't make these things big enough," and, and we were just like. These two like 13 year old Jewish boys meeting Charles Oakley. And yeah. it was like, it was perfect. And it was, and listening to him on your podcast was like, it was everything you kind of would want. It was a cross between, and he wasn't drunk, but I'm just using this analogy. Your <laughs> drunk uncle at Thanksgiving yes. who you don't know what he's going to say yes. Yeah. Crossed with Charles Oakley. <laughs> Yeah, was well, like, where's this going? Oh no! Oh, it's another story. It yeah. was great. I loved it so much. Yeah, and him kind of like talking smack about Isaiah. Oh, like, we have people from thirty years ago. Carl Malone. I love it. He called Bernard King brown eyes for some reason. <laughs> it felt insulting. I didn't know why. He's like, yeah, we called him brown eyes. I'm like, okay, Charles uh, Oakley, right, fair enough. But he was it was fascinating because it was like he's still holding those grudges, but Jordan is exempt. Like he's yes. his buddy, but it was interesting of like, it's like, oh, if he had never played on a team with Jordan, would he, would Jordan have been exempt? There was one other guy who, Ahmad seemed like he was exempt. He was okay with Ahmad. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was fascinated by that. I mean, he didn't have anything. He was okay. It seemed like he was okay with Pippen. Yeah. Yeah. He seemed, and it seemed like he was okay with Ewing, but he, then everybody else. He everyone had, else was, he was kind of, he loved guy. Mason. 
Right. Mason's, Anthony Mason. But it was like, that's like his, like, feels like would have been his protege of sorts. It's kind of amazing they were together. I know. I was and thinking. That nobody died. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was thinking about that too. I was like, oh right, they played together on that team it's, and went out at night. Uh, oh my god, I can't imagine what in New those, York City. Oh my god, before cell phones. Yeah, like before. I mean, you can't imagine. We used to, me and my friend Andrew, we would used to prank call WFAN. Like that was our thing when we were like thirteen years old, and we would call up like. Um, uh, Mike and the Mad Dog a little bit, but uh, oh god! Oh, the, the, are you the talking about the late night guys? Yeah, yeah. There's Steve Summers, and then Russ Salzberg was the W O R Channel yeah. Nine guy, and then he had the show on the sweater. And we would call him up and prank call him and be like, "Yeah, I think Patrick Ewing should be playing point because he can see over the top, you know." And, <laughs> and, and they didn't know; he never knew if we were messing with him yeah. until my friend was like, "You know, I, I'd love to take a bubble bath with Anthony Mason. He's a very attractive man." <laughs> and then that's when we. Got got cut off but in my mind i'm always thinking about anthony mason in a bubble bath oh my god yeah i i uh my mom lived in connecticut for a while mm. and so i was there and i went to high school there and was there you know during holidays and summers things like that because i moved back to massachusetts yeah. but that was during the time when you went out till like two in the morning and driving home it was the early days of the all night radio oh yeah and yeah. so you'd hear those calls like that, and you're like, that person's either drunk or pranking. And there's no there's no <laughs> other there. It's yeah. a 15 year old prank prank call person yeah. or somebody who's had 14 drinks. Yeah. And they're both are for me equally entertaining. <laughs> equally and the, the key was to as someone who was pranking, was to ride the line of being like, is this guy drunk? Or yeah. is he we don't know. You keep him around. We used to do it. It was we kill so much time that way. Those guys. It was so funny how unform like I think they put more thought into the shows now. I'm not saying they're better or worse, but mm -hmm. you could at least feel like there's a rundown now. It's like coming up, we're gonna talk about whether LeBron's going to the Rockets. Back then, it was like, uh, let's go to Nick from White Plains. <laughs> yeah, we'll let Nick from White Plains uh, let's pop run the agenda. On the line. Yeah. It was just completely <laughs> caller centric. Oh my god! And there were some great, and you did know some of the callers. There was a woman who would call. Doris from Rockaway. She <clears throat> she had this weird cough on. I mean, she mm. there were those callers that I fell in love with. And it's true, there was no agenda, there was no Twitter, there was no internet. Stories unfolded slowly. And you know, you just sort of like you rolled with it because that was your only way in for the day. I'm old enough to remember when there was no W fan. Yeah. When I would be listening i'll be at my mom's house and the draft is coming up and this guy dave sims yeah i know the name yeah black guy bald yeah 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 um he's been around forever and he used to have this three-hour draft show and that on, was it on whatever the it wasn't even the fan it was like something else yeah. and it was like a night before and i was like i would listen i would get so excited i would listen to the whole thing I tried to call in. I finally got in once. I got some call. Oh, do you think the Celtics will take Len Bias? Or like, uh, <laughs> if they're lucky, yeah, well. well, maybe. Uh, but that was it. We were so starved for anything. And I'm just like, how did you even know to know about that show? I'm still fascinated. You know what I mean? Like, like there was no internet you to like be like stumble across. Yeah, it. and then you're just like, I remember that was the way. Again, me and my buddy Andrew found American Gladiators. Like this is a different just thing. But channels. Yeah, it was like flipping through the channels, and it was like Connecticut. And then all of a sudden it blows up and you think you're the one who discovered it because you're like, I, we found this thing. But I, I had that same, you were so starved for it at that point and there was an analysis like there is. And I'm um, really jealous of people now because I was thinking like ECW was like that and I didn't even know what ECW was. Mm -hmm. and you a lot of stuff happened flipping channels at 1.30 in the morning. Yeah. In the late eighties, early nineties, and that was like, "What's this?" Yeah, and wow, that guy just jumped from a scaffold. This is cool. <laughs> yeah, is this on every week? No, and now it's you find. I mean, now it's. I guess it's people are discovering that through whatever. But like the web, you just it's just everything is so. I mean, you guys are doing you do it yourselves. You present such a plethora of information. Yeah, we're there like immediately after we're. Just, uh, season finale of billions and our podcast is ready it's crazy back to, in that 30 years ago you watch billions you have no idea if anyone else is even watching it i, I yeah i don't know how we shared it. or that like there were iconic tv shows that you'd be like oh of course there was that episode of the different strokes where he goes to the visit the bike shop or whatever yeah, yeah. it was like you're like how did we all watch i guess we caught it in reruns but it's like no you had to be watching that episode like i was talking to friends about that the uh 
the Cosby Show episode where Rudy sings the the Ray Charles, you oh, know, yeah. where they're like that big or the Monopoly episode. And it's like, how do we all know that episode so well from watching it once or twice? Like, it, did it just stick? I don't know. I don't, I don't we know. had less entertainment options. Right yes, now. that is I, the truth. I think I've told this story in the podcast before, but when I had my column in college and it was starting to take off, I had a joke about I didn't understand. Remember the three part Brady Bunch episode, the Hawaii episode? Yeah. yeah. And Vincent Price kidnaps the kids. He tortures them. <laughs> and then the Brady's rescue the kids. And then they feel bad for Vincent Price. They invite him to the luau. It's very sweet. And it ends with like, he's at the luau having a good time. <laughs> it's like, hey, our kidnapper's here. <laughs> Can somebody get another pita colada? And so I, I mentioned that in the column. And all these people come to be like, hey, man, I saw the Vincent Price thing. But it was like we were having yeah. all these individual experiences with these TV shows and had no idea if anybody else even knew about them. Yeah. I was like, oh, man, I'm so glad you brought that up. It was not We've a collective. about that for years. Yeah, there was nothing collective about no. it. Like now where you're like, hey, I mentioned this Vincent Price thing. Like people are going to listen to this and immediately now go on YouTube, watch that Vin and have that experience right away where it's like if you didn't catch it. I don't know if that changes like fandom now. Like if you, I think it totally. When did the league come out? Oh, uh, oh, like oh six, oh seven. Uh, now it's oh nine, oh eight, uh, like oh nine. It was last decade. Yeah, end of last decade, beginning of this, like oh nine, ten or something. But like it caught that. the Twitter wave. Yes, it caught. I think the, Twitter yeah. was the game changer in a lot of ways. Yes, this stuff. Yes, where it's like. You have a funny bit in a show. People are tweeting about it. It's getting forward. It's getting read. And, and yes. it just kind of goes. Yes. I We caught the be either the beginning of that. I think Twitter was around. But and you caught the streaming part where people could catch up on a whole season. And that three, was the, the biggest. Days. Like we were on. We were kind of not buried, but we were on FX barely season one. And then it was on Netflix and everyone between season one and two watched it on Netflix and then found it through that. Um, and it, I remember Friday Night Lights. Yeah. Was pre-streaming. Yeah. And I made the choice not to watch it and missed it. And then all these people in my life were like, like angry at me. Yeah. Like, it's fucking crazy that you don't watch Friday Night <laughs> yeah. Lights. Like yeah. I was like robbing school children or something. <laughs> and I ended up getting Japanese DVDs on eBay. And I watched the whole season and it had Japanese subtitles at the bottom. Oh <laughs> and banged out all of them in four days. But there's no streaming. Now I, I just be like, all right, I'll watch it on Netflix. Well, dude. that's, I weirdly never watch Friday Night Lights either. I still haven't. And I literally watched the what pilot. What the fuck well, is I wrong know, with you? Well, I've been too busy kidnapping these kids. Uh, but then they invited <laughs> me to the luau and uh, it was great. But I had that. I literally watched the pilot for that like uh, two months ago to Friday Night Lights. It's, <laughs> it's a little, it's a tiny bit dated, but it's still watchable. We've had some people on the ringers. Megan Schuster watched it recently, uh, who I think is like 24, 25. Yeah. She'd just never seen it. Yeah. And was in. Like she was like, oh my God, Michael B. Jordan showed up. Like having those kind of yeah. experiences. I was like, oh, I'm a little jealous. Yeah. Well, I'm jealous I of just this. finished Game of Thrones. I wow. was like six, I started watching Game of Thrones like six years late. And like in the last year, watched all of it and now caught up. They're saying it's the best incest show ever. <laughs> it's the rap on it. Now. Yeah, that is that is the going. I, I, I can't spoil anything. Uh, but it, yes, it is. It is weird. I had that moment. I don't know what I don't know how it works. Are you allowed to talk about like if it's aired? Are, are we allowed to talk about Game oh, of fuck Thrones? That. Anyone who hasn't watched Game of Thrones at this point, they okay. can go to hell. Yeah, I had that in my writer's room where I was like, you guys can't. And they're like, shut the fuck yeah, up. And I was like, all right, fair enough. But it was like I had this moment where I was like, oh, sh like, you know, Khaleesi and Jon Snow. OK. And then I was like, wait, are they are they brother and sister? Yeah. Like you have that moment where you're like, what's the deal? I don't yeah. I watch the show, but I don't remember anybody's names. Like, are they brother? They're co oh, they're cousins. That's fine. Go That's crazy. also have my fun. experience with Thrones. I think there's a couple different types of Thrones fans and I'm in the camp of, you know, oh, the queen. Yeah. Yes. Oh, the short guy. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. just going on down the line. Like yeah. That. I didn't read the books. Did you read the books? No, no, no. I'm behind. I'm behind on a lot of like I, Harry Potter. I, I read the first book. I enjoyed it and then forgot about it. Watched the first movie or two and then forgot about it. I just watched the end of um, of um, Saving Private Ryan and realized I've never watched it. I have it's like 20 year anniversary coming up. I know. Yeah. I have like major holes. 
major holes. Sounds in, like that sounds like maybe some drugs in the past. There might have there been, been some, some major. Marijuana marijuana the, yeah, there may have been the past. Well, that was the thing is like my formative maybe years. You watched all these movies. You still yeah, remember? That You're is stoned out of your entirely mind. possible. You saw Saving Private Ryan five times. <laughs> <laughs> no recollection. I know. I've seen Shaving Ryan's Privates a number of times. <laughs> that that did burn a hole in my uh, my memories. But that is possible. But I do think there are kids who end up smoking a lot of like some people smoke a lot of pot high school college and all they do is watch TV and yeah. they remember it all or they're like I love TV movies until like sophomore junior year of high school and then I started kind of like screwing around and then have a huge hole from like 16 to like 22 of being like oh I was like not watching TV I watched like you know Simpsons and Seinfeld reruns I have a hole too when I from when I was in college but I ended up retroactively catching up on <laughs> But I'm curious. There's some shows I miss, though. Like what? Anything that you're like? I mean, I'm just trying to think of. I I feel like uh, Martin. I just missed. Oh, see, I caught Martin because that was like in my I'm home and, you know, like, I don't know if I was watching reruns or watching it live, but I definitely caught weirdly a bunch of Martin. I missed uh, I missed in Living Color when it was happening Mm -hmm. because I was like on. I was out in college. Just see, that's like I have that that with a period of time for SNL for years where I just like. Like it was not, it was like, it's Saturday night. I'm not home on Saturday night watching the show. And it was pre like, oh, I'll watch the best sketches on Hulu the next day. I was, yeah, I was VHS in those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I had the VHS, I had the, the, the freaking tapes, all these tapes we'd bring. Do you still have no, any of those or did you get rid of them? I have them somewhere in the attic. I have, yeah. a lot, I have a lot of like VHS tapes that seem like a great idea. It's weird when like you DVDs go- seem like a great idea until about five years ago now they seem like a terrible idea do you remember when netflix switched over to streaming and everyone was like they've fucked up so royally how how stupid could they be to go streaming and get away from dvd i found i wrote this piece when the nba was headed for a lockout so october 2011 Mm -hmm. and i mentioned this piece in the last podcast i did that we wrote for grantland about like oh we should let's create a new league we'll create new teams we'll do a redraft of the players I'd forgotten. Somebody's emailed me after that piece. I have a joke in there about naming one of the teams after Netflix. And then there's a joke about, but after they go bankrupt, we'll have to change the name. It was like the Net- Netflix Quickster, the New York Netflix Quickster. Or something. Right. I was like, but after they go bankrupt, this is seven years ago. Now it's like their stocks at 400 now almost. Yeah. And they. Can- I'm an idiot is the lesson. The bottom line is, and that's why we all brought you here today, was uh, <laughs> for your podcast. Uh, yeah, it's such a weird thing. You don't, you don't know, but it's weird. I, if you go back and watch VHS, the, for me, the most interesting about going back and watching VHS is watching old commercials. Oh, yeah. And being like, whoa, like yeah. these Burger King commercials are weird. Or, you There's know, some, like not so slight racism in some of the old commercials. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what they I were, go. They just weren't afraid to be racist. No, they didn't know. Yeah, they and some sexual stuff like with the ones from the seventies, the smoking ones were like very phallic. Yeah, the guys you could see the guys groin, the girls smoking a cigarette, and it's kind of lined up with the guys groin, <laughs> shit like that. I think they made a law that you couldn't do that anymore. You couldn't use a cigarette as a phallus anymore. Yeah, as a f- simile penis <laughs> for to go in somebody's mouth. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, it's too what bad. a we combination. Should, Trump, of- Trump's Gonna get and Trump's coming back. He's going to bring it back. He's going to bring back misogyny and smoking together. Trump's like, what? We can't do that anymore? This is un-American. Let's yeah. bring it back. Yeah, those old commercials are great. A lot of those are on YouTube's. Yes, I will go back and watch old. I weirdly, I don't know why. I do like, I also still like flipping through the channels. I will flip through the Me channels. Too. Like my friends have cut their cord or like, you know, are only, you know, Netflix or they've got the ESPN app or HBO. They only have the app, whatever it is. I still am like, I kind of like flipping through channels. I still like watching commercials. I don't even kind of like it. I have direct TV and cable. Yeah. Really? I have both. Yeah. I like, I, cause I have direct TV for the football, but I like cable more cause the, the it's faster. It's faster. And you can flip channels faster. Really? And, um, I still like looking at the guide and being like, ah, Devil Wears Prada's on. Yes. Weirdly, I, there's I'll, something I'll about the yeah. world for 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. Or I'm like, oh, Tombstone's on TNT. <laughs> really? I'm in. Like, I'm like, I'll watch commercials. We'll see Kurt Russell with those pearly blues. One of my favorite things is the 10 minutes before 
Inside the NBA comes on on TNT. Mm. When TNT is showing you their bones or CSI New Orleans, <laughs> but it's just the end. There's no context at all. It's, it's just, just like somebody's lugging a corpse out of their basement and Scott Bakula's yeah. there with his, just watching them. Yeah. And then with like some slightly humorous line with like his. Uh, yeah. Slightly droll. Yeah. It's a very droll show. Yeah. It's a, it is a, I remember, I miss, um, is it still, is, uh, is, Inside stuff, it is still on, right? The it's it's a new version with Grand Hill and Kristen Ludlow. Okay, yes, I missed the old one with Ahmad and whoever his Willow, white female co-host Willow was. Bay. It was at Willow some Bay, point, and then yeah. it was somebody else. And Ahmad always had he's Ahmad. Like, yeah. he's gonna have sexual tension. It's gonna happen. He's if he's he, here right now. We'd all have sexual. We'd tension. all have he's a very sexual guy. I did sprinkler installation in high school, and we did we worked on Ahmad Rashad's house. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was all through Connecticut. They like he and Felicia Rashad lived in. Is that they were married? They are married. They were, and their daughter is now on Billions. Really? Yeah, she's got a key role on Billions. No way. She was involved in a spoiler alert plot in the last episode that I'm not going to spoil because okay, that just happened. Okay, I won't. We won't talk about it because Game I, of Thrones. I'll spoil to the all day long. long. Yeah, Ahmad Rashad's on Game of Thrones now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is he's in the last he's so, season. He's so good. Um. He, you know, and then Gumble, the like, is it Brian Gumble or Greg Gumble? Who has the show? Brian Gumble still has the show on HBO. That's Brian. Yes. And yeah. is Greg still doing CBS football? Greg is doing college hoops and football uh -huh. for CBS and is way older than you think he is. Both of, yeah. They're both, I'm like. How old do you think Greg Gumble is? This is one of my favorite games to play with. People. Oh. I would, Actually, I tipped you off because I you know, know I will. I my gut is then I I would say like sixty five. Okay, but I don't know. Like, how old is Marv Albert? Tommy, how old do you think Greg Gumbel is? Uh, sixty three. Kyle, sixty two. Greg Gumbel is seventy two years what? old. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm telling you, go to parties and just drop that on people. How does UB He's Brown? Seventy two years. <laughs> Well, Hubie Brown's like 88. Yeah. Yeah. Is he still, and is he still? Marv's like 77, 78. Marv's still, I mean. Marv, I love Marv, but he got Victor Oladipo and Darren Collison confused for a solid game <laughs> in the playoffs. Game. It just seemed like a problem. It was two of the best pacers. <laughs> Oladipo Collison. Yeah. Yes. I he, love Marv, though. He is. Marv should stay as long as he wants. Well, because he also very smartly went to pay early. So, like, there is no, he's fine. Like there was no like, oh, what's happening to Marv Albert? He's oh, that's true. He he went so early that we never even you never knew. Blink. You never knew. Or, or he did a comb over early. What and but he he because he was also a Knicks guy. He was the New York guy early. Like when I was of a like coming. That was my that was him. He was, and, he, Marv was incredible. Yes, and he's. I yes. still think he's my favorite. NBA he guy. is good. I do. I mean, I, I I've, I've, I'm fascinated by those guys. They do seem ageless. Costas, Costas hair dye is like is somewhat of an issue. <laughs> I love him. I really do. But it's anyway, I don't know what you're allowed once to say. What, no, I'm allowed to say. So what, you're allowed to say whatever okay. you want. Yeah, yeah. Once my hair started going white, I'm like, I'm not doing the Dr. Pepper. Like whatever. <laughs> yeah. This is the color of my hair. It's we're all I'm slowly letting my hair go gray. It's going to happen. Uh, and then I'll but I dye well, my pubes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have you have actor roles though, where you probably have to seem younger in certain roles and I stuff. Guess so. I don't know. I'm like if, figuring that out. Whether like if you're rapist number three in the Death Wish remake, <laughs> yes. maybe they're looking for a younger. They want a youthful look to that. <laughs> well, I'm now like you know, I'm shooting for number two. Number you know what two, I mean? Number one. Who's got some you know, more years behind him? Experience. I, I had Jeff Goldblum on. We were mm, going through his movies. Mm. And I brought up Death Wish. His first role in a movie was he was one of the three thug rapists in really? Death Wish with Charles Bronson. And oh he God. took the... It, Jeff Goldblum, by of the way, course. great podcast. Yeah, of he's course. Oh, he'll talk about everything. He, oh, he's, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah no, you, no, you look wonderful. Oh, uh, but, he, hands. but he took the question like seriously. He's uh -huh. like... Here's what I learned on the Death Wish set as his rapist number two. And uh and really went for it. I was like, okay, here we I guess that the grounds have been set. Hey, but he yeah. Tommy, we turn on that air conditioner in there. Bef he if it's not on, turn it on higher. <laughs> if it's getting hot in here, I apologize. I I'm I weirdly don't sweat. Okay, good. It's a weird element of my Great. existence. He Goldblum is someone who will take Everything incredibly seriously, and also he somehow manages to do both 
simultaneously and glibly yes yeah he played my father on the league and was like so but and would get into it and then pop out and he's so funny but he's just the weirdest he's one of the most interesting guys he plays this game did he play celebrity with you at all or this thing where he sort of will go like he doesn't like to converse when when you're not in the scene he doesn't want to have a conversation how's your life how are you doing he wants to do something else so he'll be like uh let's play the uh, movie game uh he'll go jeff goldblum uh, jurassic park okay uh uh lord dern okay lord dern was in uh uh <laughs> good <Goldblum>. uh, <laughs> he'll go like lord dern was in um uh you know uh, twin peaks okay Kyle mclaughlin okay portlandia uh, oh so it's just Fred Armisen, yeah, and then I'll go Fred Armisen, uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, and then I'll go like something, something, and then I'll go like uh, uh, Chris Pratt, uh, Jurassic Park, uh, Jeff Goldblum. He'll bring it back around to himself, <laughs> then they'll be like, and action, and then you'll be back in like a scene in the league, you're like, wait, what just fucking happened? <laughs> but he's so, but it, then he's so good, and he has aged both physically and artistically tall handsome man yeah he's i think he takes very good care of himself does a lot of like yoga eats well Mm. is married to a contortionist yeah gymnast yes yeah she she was on kroll show as a contortionist she's amazing she's so cool but he's like he's a dude who like now is how old is he six mid 60s 60s? yeah Yeah. that's like a three-year-old daughter yeah three-year-old son it's amazing let's figure it out Let's take a quick break to talk about Hotel Tonight. If you're like me and you're not so great at planning ahead, I've got some good news for you. Our friends at Hotel Tonight have an awesome app that helps you find amazing hotel deals at the last minute. Book next week tonight. Book next month tonight. Whatever you want to do. All it takes is 10 seconds, three taps, and a swipe. No long, endless list of a zillion hotel choices. Hotel Tonight only shows you the best deals at the best hotels. Perfect. Whether you're a planner or you like to leave things at the very last minute. As I have mentioned many times, I've used it for multiple youth soccer tournaments in various parts of Southern California. And now it looks like baseball. I get to go to baseball doubleheaders for a big part of the summer. Shoot me. With Hotel Tonight's HT Perks program, the more you book, the better the deals get. Unlike other loyalty programs where you're trapped into staying at boring chain hotels, that's not the case here. Start scoring amazing deals at incredible hotels and download the Hotel Tonight app right now and since we're here don't forget binge mode harry potter launch this week if you love harry potter this is the show for you mallory jason they're doing the damn thing check it out subscribe now to the binge mode podcast all right back to nick Kroll. can we talk about all the things you're up to sure before it gets so hot in here that one of us passes <laughs> out you got it um just get give me the give me the rankings of what you're working on right now the, the ran- animated show's coming big mouth season two is coming this fall. We have not announced the official okay. date, but the Big Mouth season two is this fall. We should mention that's a show that I hate you for because you put on Netflix. Yeah. And my son, it's actually too over the top for my son. But how, how old is your son? My son's 10 going oh, on yeah. like okay. 30. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 But um, yeah. it's one of those things where I know he's watching it, but he'll never uh. tell me. So <laughs> I'm sure he's seen every episode. If he was here right now, he'd be, I know he watches the Bill Burr show too. Okay. It's like, what am I not supposed to watch? All right, I'll wait till you guys leave the room and yes. I'll watch it. Yes. So it's in that camp. Okay, I would have done the same thing though. Yes, I, me too. I was. It's one of those shows that I would have snuck a watch when I like somehow. Uh, I thought you were gonna say he's like fifteen. I was like, oh come on, let him watch it. Ten, I get. It's dirty. It's f- super fucking dirty. But he loves dirty though. He loves. Oh man. I mean, it's. It's way like he loves South Park and it's way dirtier than South Park. (laughs) It has moments of being dirtier than South Park. But it's also like I will say the coolest part is like it's dirty, but there's also like real kind of lessons is the wrong word, but it gives kids and parents the ability to maybe have a platform to talk about this stuff. But I would say more like when your son is in like three years and like locked in his room because he's fucking yanking that crank, like you're going to be like, all right, we got to figure out a way to talk about this. Maybe the show provides some sort of vehicle to have those conversations, Uh, but it's filthy, but it's, I'm very, uh, they're saying it's the best white plains jerk off show (laughs) ever created. Right, right now, yes, three, yeah, top three, top three. I remember 
Malcolm Jamal Warner had one in the <laughs> late nineties that it, didn't catch on. It didn't work ex- is, as well. <laughs> Malcolm in the middle, there, they said there was, there was not enough jerking off. No, it wasn't. That was uh, the note from that. That was the major note uh, from the network. It is so dirty, but it's it's. I mean, we have a the, the fun new character. We have a couple new guys uh, characters in season two. Um, for, if you haven't seen the show, basically it's about two thirteen year old kids going through puberty, but and then it's really about a bunch of kids. So it's like. Kids masturbating, getting their periods. Oh my god! All of the, all of the kids or kids have your horm- parents' worst nightmare. I know they, but they actually like they like it. I think I don't know, but it's like the, every kid has a hormone monster. So like I we're like di- that. Every and which is really what happens. It feels like that when you're growing up. So we had a kid who was like. My, when Andrew, we were talking about the show, my buddy Andrew, I, I mentioned a few times, Andrew Goldberg, we came up with the show with our partners, Mark and Jen, and they they were sort of like, the, Andrew should have like a hormone monster. And I was like, oh, hormone monster. Like, he's just like, touch yourself, Andrew. And, and that became, <laughs> and we're like, okay, got it. So the, the, everyone has hormone monster. Season two, the big new character is the shame wizard. And so it's like <laughs> Debbie Kyle loves it. I got him. So and we got David Thewlis to be the shame wizard. Ooh. Who, if you watch Fargo season three, he's the villain in that, and he's in the Harry Potter movies. The bad guy in Wonder Woman. Wasn't he in either Island of Doctor Moreau or The Beach? Yes. Is he in Island of Doctor oh, Moreau? I don't know, but it's possible that he's in both. One of my and, favorite bad '90s movies. Whoa! And he might be in The Beach. He's he might be like those. Tilda Swinton's like boyfriend in the beach or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he's he's something. He's a badass. So it's like anyway. So it's it's that. So anyway, so that's coming out this fall. The thing that I'm probably the thing in, uh, for here that might be interesting is Uncle Drew, the basketball yes. movie I'm in. You worked with Kyrie. I worked with my dear friend Kyrie. Uh, where did it was? Where does he rank against Denzel and some of the other great actors? You know you what? Worked with? He's a good actor. Yeah. Like I was like, God damn it. This guy can and he's wearing they're all wearing tons of prosthetics. Yeah. And it's you know, I was on that show Cavemen. You know what I mean? Like I was one of the cavemen, so like I know what it's like to wear a shit ton of prosthetics. And I was truly impressed by Kyrie as an actor. He's one, he's funny. Two, he was a good actor. When you see the movie, like it's a the movies there has to be some emotional thing for to carry that for two hours and he's got it man it's like he's really I, i'm sure do you have you gotten to know him this year or in years past like have you there's you, a there's a chance he's appearing on this podcast relatively soon yes he's and i really i mean i liked him i was impressed uh he was ready he was prepared and all those guys actually like all those players like these aren't fuck offs like they can't like these guys all they do is show up to practice do their work. And so when they come to, perf- and the same thing for the most part on the league too, is like these guys come ready to go. This is the LeBron generation. Yes. We yes. had the cocaine generation. Yes. No, that we, is. We had the uh, hip hop generation. Mm-hmm. And then eventually we eased into the LeBron handle your business, yes. try to become a brand, show up on time, get yeah. your shit done, have Ab- five things going on generation. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and I felt like that with Kyrie, but then we had, Everybody else that it's you know it's Reggie Miller, Shaq, Chris Webber, Lisa Leslie, Nate Robinson, mm. and uh, you know when they they told me about the movie, I was like, oh that's I like those Uncle Drew videos like that were on you know YouTube, and then I was like, I want to, I mean I thought that I was like I don't care if this movie's good or bad. I actually think the movie's very funny and good, but I was like I just want to go spend a month with those guys on the court fucking around like that's uh, you know for me as a kid who grew up right watching those guys it was like the idea that i could be and i end up playing in the game so i deed up Kyrie, or i tried to have you did you used to play or i mean we're talking like like jewish day school right basketball i was decent yeah for jewish day school basketball nice. so it was not i was to, to give you some context uh, I wasn't getting I wasn't getting any offers to play college ball, uh, but uh, I you know I I loved playing growing up. But I was like I, I was like the opportunity to play. How many people get the opportunity to play defense against Kyrie Irving? But it's against the guy who's got like well nobody can guard him anyway, so it doesn't matter your Jewish day school background exactly. versus being Damian Lillard. Yeah, exactly. Matter. So I'm in the I'm in the trailer. I don't know if it's going to be in the movie, but in the trailer when you see like here's Uncle Drew's handle. 
Like, that's me playing defense against him. And I did not fall down. He did not break my ankle. Like, none of that. I was like, I'll take that as a huge win. And it was so fun. And then I'm on the bench as the coach. And I'm the I'm the... I'm I'm the bad guy. I'm the the bad guy coach. Oh, the evil guy. I'm the bad guy. I'm the white devil in this movie. You're like Tupac and above the rim. <laughs> yes, exactly. But not. Yeah. I'm like, I never saw Blue Chip, but I'm trying to think of whatever Nick Nolte is. I'm probably not him. Right. But another Shaq, another fine Shaq. But I got to hang out with Shaq. I'm, I, I mean, I, I had, I couldn't have had more fun. Like I had one night where I got to chill with Shaq. Shaq's a fun guy by all accounts. He is so like, I guess if you're like seven, however tall he is for your whole life, you either retreat into yourself or you make everyone in the room comfortable. And he made, I think he made a choice to just be, make everyone in a room feel comfortable around him. Kimmel's, you know, Kimmel loves Shaq. Yeah. His, like, I think his favorite celebrity story ever was Shaq was on Ellen at some point. (laughs) in the in the last 10 years and offered his cousin a hundred thousand dollars to come on the stage and take a shit as they were taping on. And the cousin or the nephew was seriously considering yeah. it. Yeah. And it was like, should I do it? Like it was like one of those I was like, what is happening? That's the best but though. And because Shaq that's is That's what Shaq's like every day. I he's think. a real rascal. Yeah. He is a real He tried to bring back roasts. Yes. I love the Shaq roasts. They're they did so... Emmett Smith, they did Shaq. Oh, I thought yeah. those were great. That's the one where if you go back and watch that Jamie Foxx where he, he ruins the dude. He ruins a dude. Like where you're like, ooh, this is roasts are tough, but this is Rough, but the guy sh- shouldn't have come at him. No, you shouldn't come. Don't come at him, especially when other guys have mics. Like Jamie's not even up there; he's just got a mic in the background doing the in- inner voice of that guy, and it's brutal. Those two roasts are on YouTube, and they first of all, that's how I met Jimmy because he was on the first one, oh. and I wrote about it on page two at uh-huh, ESPN, uh-huh. and he sent me an email. I was like, "Hey, man, I really appreciate what you said," and we started talking. But the set, the one of them was the one I think it was Emmett Smith. Jeff Ross came on. And it was like the moment he became the roast master. Oh, like that's officially. really interesting. I have not got to go back on watching watch that on YouTube because it was like an all black audience, and he just came in. Oh, Ross and, is and was like annihilate. Just he was just out of control. Yeah, oh. all that stuff's on YouTube. But Jamie Fox, that's brutal. Killed that poor guy. Killed him. But Shaq, I really loved, and he's even a guy who I was like, I sat down with him one night. We were in between setups, and I just sort of interviewed him for like an hour, just being like, I don't know when I'm going to get a chance. He's sitting on an Apple box, still taller than me. Yeah. And he, it was just interesting to hear him be like, just like, again, works constantly working, constantly. He's like, you never know what's going to happen. I'm going to be nice to people because, you know, he's like, I was nice to this kid who I played basketball in my neighborhood. I would just be nice to him. And then his father came up to me one day and was like, I had a, my son had a dream that you played a genie. And that's where like. Kazam? Yeah. I would love to see Kazam again and see how it held up. I'm I, gonna guess it didn't. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I can't. When does imagine. Uncle Drew come out? Uncle Drew comes out June 29th. Um, and it's like Nate Robinson's funny. He's a rascal. Nate Robinson's a rascal. Uh, and Reggie Miller for me. I grew up again early 90s New York. I was at the, the at that game. That spike. You felt like game. you were rivals with him. Yes. Yeah. And I was at that game. But now I'm on the bench. And I'm the bad guy. And so I'm just talking shit. And Reggie is shooting threes. Like we're shooting segments, you know, in the in the game. And Reggie's got to be, he's supposed to be missing threes. And then he's supposed to be hitting threes. And he's missing threes. And I'm just fucking yapping away at Reggie Miller on the bench talking shit. And I was like, this for me, this there could be no no more fun in my career that I can be on the bench razzing Reggie Miller yeah, for seriously. missing threes. And he and then he was lovely, and then he started hitting threes, and it was not as fun. <laughs> I did, I did uh, TV for a year with Magic. Yeah, and it was just Celtics oh, Lakers God. from the get go. And I would always use we, and it was like I was on the team. And the first like month or so, he'd be like, "Man, you you weren't on the team, you know?" Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. By March, it was like I was on the team, and I was like the ninth man on the eight to six Celtics. Says, "Well, remember we came back, and we he just accepted me as a rival." <laughs> but back then, you were just like Danny Ainge stand yeah, yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. You might have thought I was Jerry Seachstick. <laughs> um, tell me how you got hooked up with Mulaney. Is there a backstory? Uh, we went to college together. Uh, what college? We went to Georgetown. 
Uh, oh, you motherfucker. I got rejected by Georgetown. I only got it because my dad Jesus. went there. <laughs> Is that why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I really wanted to go there. It was like the height of the Alonzo morning. Oh, the man. Kimba Matumbo. I was like so ready to jump into it. Yeah. my That's when my brother was there. And my mom came and visited one time. And my brother and... Alonzo, they were all in this one rabbi's. They all the basketball players were in a Jewish studies class because the rabbi was notoriously an easy grader. And my mom came to visit, and my brother <laughs> fell asleep in the class. And oh, no. Alonzo's asking questions the entire class. And wow. my mom was like, "It's good student. What's going on? Yeah, yeah." But that was the Twin Towers. That was that. I mean, that was. Is who a, wants to sex Matumbo? A true story. That's. I've heard that. I don't know. I've heard that story. It seems like it came after. I think it's made up. But I've heard. I've heard. Definitely heard lore of it. And I would. By the way, the dude speaks seven languages. If you're gonna. Now that I've had Oakley, Matumbo's probably my dream podcast, and I'm oh. gonna have to ask him. He's real like Players Association now, or oh, he's yeah. like he's, he's super involved. Real thoughtful dude. Yeah, yeah. Because I think he also comes here. I mean, the lure was also like he came here to be pre med, and then decided to play basketball. It's like I don't know about that. That was when I stopped playing basketball. When I was in like, or I realized that there was a limit to it. I went to John Thompson basketball camp mm. when I was like 14. And I was like, I'm pretty good. And then I got down there and it was like all kids from like Silver Springs, like all like, you know, D.C. metro area kids. You didn't see like, a lot of kids from the Jewish day school? No, they were not. No, they were not. And I was like, oh, oh, mm. oh, maybe I'll be in a movie one day where I get to play basketball. Like that'll the, be the end of it. The good news is the Jewish day school will be a great season three for the animated series. Oh, my God. It's true. The whole jerk off scandal in the Jewish oh day school. Oh, my God. Everybody. 19, 1988. We do have Jewish penises on the show. We've got a that's lot good. of we got some stuff in there. That's pretty Jewy. Jew Fishman. <laughs> we have a character named Jew Fishman. The <laughs> Jew Fishman. Um, but me, me and Melanie met at Georgetown. I was in, I was the director of the improv group. He was a freshman. I cast him in the troupe. And like within a month, I was like, oh, this dude. Yeah. Like I was I was the senior. Like I was supposed to be the hot stuff. Yeah. And within a month, I was like, oh, this dude is like the real deal. And but even like I had been I have a bunch of my friends even before Melanie got there, like Ber Mike Berbiglia cast me in the improv group at Georgetown. Like we have a weird there was like a weird group of us there that were all kind of doing it. Uh, and. So it was great, but and but also Georgetown wasn't like a comedy school, so we got to do everything. We hosted a cappella fest, like we just right. it, it got us a lot of stage time. Um, but John and I met freshman year, his freshman year, and just stayed buddies. And then I moved to New York, and he would like come up and stay with me, and we'd go to like open mics and just. When did you start doing the two guys doing comedy together thing? Because that, oh, that has oh, had hello? very mixed results over the years. Yes, we we. Let's well, no, see. you've done it in a variety of things. Like you've hosted award shows yes. now. Yes, we we started. I mean, we were always buddies, and then we did years ago in New York. Uh, over ten years ago, we started hosting like a weekly stand-up show as as George and Gill from Oh Hello, and it was just fun. It was like it was like I think we'd watched a lot of Jiminy Glick. We had watched a ton of Martin Short, and it was like that thing of like, oh, it'd be fun to be the characters interviewing these other people who are like, I don't know what's about to come out of your mouth. I'm, I'm scared. Uh, and, and then we, we kept doing them. And then I started doing Kroll show. We started doing Oh, hello on Kroll show. And then that finished. And then we started doing the, we got the Broadway show together and then they offered, uh, I think they came to me to do the spirit awards. And I was like, they're like, you could do it with someone. Or you could do it on your own. And I was like, I think this would be more fun to do with someone. John yeah. and I were doing Oh Hello. He was the funniest person I'd ever met. It just felt like an obvious thing to to be like, hey, do you want to go do this thing? I thought you guys were good. I think that's a hard job, especially. Thanks. You're standing next to each other and you've already heard all the jokes, but you have to react like you've never heard them yeah. before. But I think it. I find it to be much, those award shows, to be with someone on stage, to me, is so much more relaxing and fun because you yeah. have someone else to play with. If a joke doesn't go well, you've got someone else up there with you. Like I'm like Jimmy hosting the Oscars last few years when we had hosted the Spirit Awards. They're very, very different things. I was not envious of him and I think he did a great job, but I was not envious of him for a second. Your room's a little friendlier. It's friendlier. You know, it's everyone's of a sp specific world and space. You're not On playing the other hand, though, you had the Weinstein stuff this year. Yeah. And people were expecting something from you. 
Whereas he, I think with Jimmy, he, you know, because that's like as PG of an audience as yes. you get. You get, you got to tiptoe it, but you can't hit it hard. But we, you, people wanted you to hit it we, hard. At some we, we felt like we had an opportunity to say some stuff that other people couldn't. I yeah. think like Seth doing the Globes and Jimmy doing the Oscars. Seth was the test pilot. Yes. Seth got shot in yes. the face. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, I think that's a John joke who wrote that for John for Seth of like the monkey the the monkey that gets shot in his yeah, face. Yeah, he, he literally was. Yeah, that and, was not an enviable hosting spot. No, and I thought and he threaded that needle well, but it's just tough if you're either of those dudes on those shows to play to that broad of an audience and be like, how can I be funny and also not inflame everybody or avoid everything entirely yeah um and because of the size of the stage that we were at doing the spirits we had a little more uh, we had a i think we i don't know i i don't know if we felt like this is expected of us or if we were just like fuck it let's just we have the opportunity to go i think so i think like we have the opportunity to go say some shit and take some shots that we wouldn't if we were doing a bigger stage like Jimmy. I watched yours carefully. I watched Seth's carefully too because I was worried for Jimmy because I felt like the audience that he had for that Oscars with all the landmines in the room. Oof. And there were a couple lessons. Like it did seem like, you know, just going hard with a name. Like people would clench up a little bit if yes. there was a name. So there were like end arounds where you could yes. make the name the punchline or sneak it around. Or We found that as we figured out like even the order with which we were doing jokes. We were running it that week and you, we were ending. We were like, oh, we have this run about the apologies, like how guys failed at, at their apologies. And we did it in the middle of the week and it was killing in the middle of the in the middle of the set. Yeah. So we're like, all right. This is our big closer. This is the b- biggest last. Let's put it at the end of the set. And we put it at the end of the set and it stopped working as well. And we felt just after the set like icky. And it was like, ooh, we got to put this somewhere in the middle because people don't want to finish on this. We need to find like a palate cleanser or something. because yeah, people a sorbet. D- yes. Because people didn't want that in the middle of the show. People didn't want you. They didn't want to. At the old end of the day what we were thinking and realizing is like, we're still ultimately hosting a show. Yeah. And this is a big night for a lot of people and people want to have fun and celebrate. People don't want this entire show to be like, what a fucking gross year. What a gross culture we are in the middle or whatever it is. People want to be like, let's have fun tonight. You know? So you like all of the machinations of where you place things was, there were a lot of kind of interesting lessons to be learned. We have to go. But, where, where are we going? But so funny. But you got to come back. I saved some stuff. I would love. I to. I want you to come on for a rewatchables podcast. We do. We break down yeah. these movies. You're kind of built to join us for one of them. I would love to. We we go backwards. We've had. We will do anything ranging from Social Network to great. Right. We did that one. Castaway is going to happen this summer. Ooh. Yeah, I've a lot, but a lot of like things I'm wondering like that. if it things should be one that I, ha- years. I have not seen that it won't be it'll be a watchable for me or should it be a rewatchable <laughs> a first watchable maybe, like I don't know if I've ever seen Castaway podcast. like I don't know if I've ever seen Castaway for podcast first watchable <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, sponsored by Lunchables everything? oh Operation Finale okay I'm in this movie a Nazi hunting movie yes it's uh, Oscar Isaac and uh, Sir Ben Kingsley is uh uh, Adolf Eichmann, and we're like Nazi. Uh, we're uh, uh, Mossad agents. Uh, when it's the true story of capturing Adolf Eichmann in Argentina, so it's like a serious movie. It's like a serious like oh, thriller, wow. like Argo. But uh, and that's that comes out September fourteenth. That that sounds good. Yeah, it's fun. Cool. Oscars uh, super cool and funny and and, and amazing. And, and it's Sir Ben Kingsley like in like classic Sir Ben mode. It's it's pretty crazy. What's your favorite Sir Ben Kingsley? I have a random one. What is yours? Searching for Bobby Fischer. Oh, I love that movie. Shit. It's really good. That movie still holds up. It's like 25 years old. That's a good movie. That might be a watchable for me. That might too. be a watchable. Maybe yeah. that's episode two of the watchables. Oh <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, uh, you know what he's actually great in, in like the movie's not great to me, but like Iron Man Three, where he's playing his oh, it's sexy beast for me. He's really sexy, good sexy beast, beast in that movie. He did play Gandhi. Yeah. He did win an Oscar. Yeah, fine. Fine. Fucking, no, yeah. Come on. Anyone can play Gandhi. I mean, Jesus. Who didn't? Um, Who hasn't played Gandhi? Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, All man. Right. 
All right, thanks to Proper Cloth, the leader in men's custom shirts. Create your custom shirt size by answering 10 easy questions. Shirts start at $80. They will be delivered in two weeks. Perfect fit guaranteed. And if a shirt doesn't fit, they will remake it for free. For premium quality, perfect fitting shirts, visit propercloth.com slash BS. Use gift code BS to get $20 off your first custom shirt today. Thanks to ZipRecruiter. Don't forget to check them out at ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. They will help you with anything you need in any hiring department, whether you're hiring, whether you want to be hired. Check them out. And last but not least, HBO, June 19th, 9 o'clock, courtside at the NBA Finals, the show we did about uh, the NBA Finals and everything that happens there. So that's coming up. All you have to do is just go on your uh, cable guide, just record it, and it'll be on your DVR. It's an hour. It's an hour of your life. It's nothing. Back on Friday with another BS podcast. Until then. <laughs>